The Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and your local cable provider presents Cable Reports. Join us now as Cable Reports brings you up to date on current issues facing the Commonwealth through discussions with your local legislators and other policymakers from across Virginia. Welcome to a special edition of Cable Reports, brought to you by the Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association, connecting Virginians to their government. We're pleased to have Molly Ward, Secretary of Natural Resources for the Commonwealth of Virginia with us today. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Woody. It's great to be here. Well, the protection of natural resources is a big responsibility. Tell us about uh, your agency. Absolutely. It's a big responsibility, and it's actually mandated in the Virginia Constitution that we care for and manage carefully our natural resources. And so we take very seriously, and I take very seriously, and the governor takes very seriously the stewardship of the amazing things in Virginia, whether it's our historic resources or our natural areas um, and, our, and our parks and our waterways. Talk to us a little bit about those parks because I think uh, that's a subject that interests everyone. Yeah, we have an amazing state park system. We have 36 state parks all over the Commonwealth. Um, anywhere you are, the goal is to be less than an hour away from a state park. And our state parks have day use passes. It's just 4 or $5 per car. You can put as many people as you want in a car to go use a park for the day, so it's affordable for everyone. We also have a lot of parks with cabins, and those cabins range from the original Conservation Corps cabins that are like logs to modern cabins with air conditioning and, and uh, you know, every amenity. Um, and we also have great camping spaces. We have camping cabins in many of our state parks. There's a yurt on the water of the, on the Chesapeake Bay. At a Kip yurt? Yes, a wow. yurt at Kipta Peak State Park. I've stayed there myself. It's, it's an amazing and wonderful place to stay. We have six bedroom lodges that you know sleep up to 16 people. There's almost any kind of lodging or facility that you want. And so um, it's just a great opportunity for Virginia families. And they're open 365 days a year. So you can always go to a Virginia State Park. So what's your favorite park? Oh, that's, I'm not allowed to say. That's like, <laughs> that's like having a favorite child. But um, uh, I love them all. And I was a big fan of state parks before I ever got this job. And uh, the first family has embraced the state parks. The governor, I think, has been up to, he's been to 24 out of 36. He's pledged to go to all of them. And he and his family have vacationed. And, well, actually, the governor never really vacations, to be honest with you. The governor yeah. has gone <laughs> to state parks and worked over weekends with this family since he's been in office, and it's been a great boon to the staff and to uh, the visibility of the state park system. So uh, how tough a job is it to, to maintain uh, these state parks, especially the infrastructure? It is tough, and we have managers. Um, I like to say that it's not a job, it's a lifestyle. Um, we have folks, most of our superintendents have been in the park system 20 or 30 years, and they've raised their children in the parks, and you know, they're now they're bringing their grandchildren to the parks, and it's, it's just a way of life for them. And they, these guys, and, and men and women, can you know, fix lawnmowers, and do carpentry, and set up camping spaces, and you know, shoo away raccoons, they do it all, you know, 24-7. Um, so it is a challenge. The governor's proposed budget, well, his bond package, um, mm -hmm. has $140 million for state parks. So a lot of that going to existing infrastructure, because we know we have to take care of what we have in addition to growing for the future. So are you responsible for all the wildlife in the parks? We are responsible for everything within the state park boundaries. Um, we also have in our agency, I mean, in our secretary at the Department of Game and Inland Fisheries, which are responsible for managing Virginia wildlife. So the state parks, if there is a wildlife management issue, works together with the Department of Game and Inland Fisheries in that regard. Like, for instance, we have some parks that get overpopulated by deer, mm -hmm. and some of our parks have hunting. Uh, times like you know a few days a year where they have a lottery and they work with the Department of Game and Fisheries to manage wildlife in those kinds of ways. Now, now, what kind of people uh, uh, go to the parks these days? Has the demographics changed over the last twenty to thirty years? It has, and we continue to try to adjust for you know the changing needs and wants. Um, you know, the old model was two parents and four children. Um, and that model has changed. We have a lot of millennials who are enjoying the parks. We see a lot of couples and people having couples weekends and even romantic weekends in the parks. So we're trying to adjust. In the last budget um, last year that the, that the uh, House and Senate passed, there's money for your, uh, more money for yurts. Because I see these yurts as very, uh, the one in, in, at Kipta Peak's a moneymaker. Um, they're not very expensive to put up and they're easy to maintain. 
and um, we're hoping that that'll draw some new visitors to the park as well, some people who want a different kind of experience. So talk to us about the necessity to, to conserve not only our state parks, but, but also all the natural resources we enjoy in the Commonwealth. Well, it's essential. You know, we are, um, our economy and our vitality and our future is all linked to our natural resources because that's why people want to live here. Um, the most important, one of the most important uh, natural resources, of course, is, is one of the largest estuaries in the world, the Chesapeake Bay. And we recognize the importance of the bay for the health of Virginia. And we actually have a deputy secretary for the Chesapeake Bay, Russ Baxter, who works full time on bay issues. Um, also, the governor has been appointed by his fellow governors. There's a seven uh, governor plus the mayor of Colum uh, District of Columbia together who form the Chesapeake Bay program that's run by the EPA. And the governor was elected by his uh, peers to be chair of the Chesapeake Bay uh, program. And so he is the head of the executive council, which in turn makes Russ and me and, and uh, Russ and I responsible for the uh, activities of the principal staff committee of that Chesapeake Bay program. So we have an enormous amount of responsibility with regards to Bay issues through the EPA. We're also members of something called the Chesapeake Bay Commission, which is a tri-state um, organization that's organized through the different legislatures of Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Virginia that we work with on Bay issues. And then, of course, we just work on Bay issues through the Department of Conservation Recreation and the Department of Environmental Quality because we're so concerned about meeting our Bay milestones in 2017 and beyond. Also, in go that ahead, regard, go ahead. Go ahead. the governor put a tremendous amount of water quality improvement fund money in his budget. There was a surplus last year, as you know, in the budget, and what that meant was $61 million automatically by code went into the water quality improvement fund. And traditionally, that would get divided between um, uh, non-point source pollution, like farm agricultural mm -hmm. runoff, and wastewater treatment plants. So traditionally, that would have been an approach. But we decided to take a more uh, proactive and aggressive approach and decided to try to borrow the money for the wastewater treatment plant. So you know exactly what's in the queue. It's about $59 million worth of projects. So we wanted to fund those projects and get, go ahead and get those improvements done and then use as much as we could of the $61 million for non-point source. Um, interestingly enough, you know, one of the big problems we have in Virginia and all throughout the Bay Watershed is stream exclusion um, and keeping cows out of streams. And so mm -hmm. we're spending a lot of that money on technical assistance for stormwater and conservation, stormwater, soil, wa soil and water conservation districts and on um, uh, best management practices for farms. And that money gets um, almost em evenly divided between farms in the Bay Watershed and those out of the watershed in the Commonwealth. But big, 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 big investment in water quality by Governor McAuliffe. So that's one of the, the biggest challenges, the, the, the ability to keep uh, animals out of these streams? Yes. Yes, you know, animal and human waste are, are, are what's the big part of the load on the bay, for, for sure. Absolutely. Now, you mentioned the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. What kind of relationship does your, your agency have with the EPA and also the Department of the Interior, if, if any, at the federal level? We have a great relationship with EPA. Our regional administrator, Sean Garvin, um, calls us and we're in contact with him um, in person and by phone constantly. Um, so we maintain a very close work working relationship with the EPA and um, the governor has a very good relationship with the administrator, Gina McCarthy. We work with them all the time. Um, we also um, have a good relationship with the Department of the Interior. John Jarvis, the director of the National Park Service, was here um, last summer and went out to Tangier with the governor when he went out to Tangier Island for the first time. And the, the director of the National Park Service himself came down to meet with the governor and go out to uh, Tangier Island. Uh, the governor and I have been to the Department of Interior on more than one occasion to meet with uh, the Sally Jewell, the director, mm -hmm. and with uh, John Jarvis. And so, um, and Director Jarvis is actually a Virginian. Many people don't know that. He went to Natural Bridge High School, and his first job was at Natural Bridge uh, selling uh, kitschy things in the, <laughs> in the gift shop. And uh, he, Virginia is very near and dear to his heart. And certainly that relationship with the Department of Interior was important in getting the deed signed from Virginia to um, the United States government to finally complete the Fort Monroe National Monument. But for Governor McAuliffe and his relationships in the Obama administration and with the Department of Interior, I'm not sure we would have actually pulled that off. Uh, tell us a little bit more about that process and the significance of that deed signing. It was huge because... Um, we had, the governor had, I mean, the president had signed the proclamation uh, designating Fort Monroe National Monument in 2011, but getting the actual deed recorded, transferring the property, proved to be a challenge. 
Um, and so, uh, you know, you're dealing with two uh, bureaucracies, essentially, in the federal and state government. And Governor Kauf is famous for cutting through all those kinds of things and, and making sure that we get the, the deal closed. And so I think it was very important that we get that done while Governor Kauf was still in office. And I'm, we're really proud of this because um, Fort Monroe was the uh, President Obama's first uh, N Antiquities Act designation. There's two ways to get a national park. One is through Congress, an act of Congress, and one is if the president can actually sign a proclamation making a national monument, and they're equal um, mm. under the eyes of the law. And so obviously getting anything through Congress is difficult, and seemingly getting it, the president to sign something would be easier. But the, the president's first Antiquities Act designation wasn't signed until November 2011, three years into his first term. So since then, he's signed several, and he just signed three more last week. So Virginia's particularly proud that we've, we hope that um, we're very proud to be the first one right. in a long line of designations right. by the president. For those who may not be aware, where is Fort Monroe located? Fort state? Monroe is lo located in my hometown, Hampton, Virginia. You know, I used to be the Hampton mayor and was very involved in uh, advocating for Fort Monroe to be a national monument. It's, I encourage all Virginians to go. It's open to the public. It, it's completely free of charge to visit. It's the oldest stone fortification, and largest stone fortification in America. Um, it was designed by Robert E. Lee. Um, it's the sign of many, many, many uh, uh, important historical moments in, in Virginia history and in, in United States history, and particularly the story of the contraband slaves, which I don't know if you're familiar with, but um, you know, hugely important, and, and that's what led to the designation of it as a national monument by President Obama. So I've, obviously uh, this national monument and other sites throughout the state are important to tourism in Absolutely. Virginia. Absolutely. Oh, there's no question. Um, uh, the tourism dollars are enormous. And every single one of these state parks, some of the state parks generate money and some um, are, have revenue loss. So um, there's a balance there, but every single one of them brings things to communities, you know, convenience store sales, gas sales you know, sundry sales, um, increased traffic, you know, it, every community is thrilled and grateful to have a park there. Um, I've done all 36 state parks and I've actually gone and I didn't just do drive through, I went and, you know, hiked and met with the managers and met with the local elected officials and met with the friends groups, spent the night in every single state park where I could spend the night just to really get a feel for it. And um, these community relationships are so important and we really focus on that. So how does this relate to uh, what is called the new Virginia economy? It relates beautifully because we need to look for new places and new ways to attract visitors and economic growth. And a lot of places in Virginia, especially in the southwest, which have been really hurt by, you know, coal and tobacco declines, um, you know, some of these places, the, the state park is the economic driver. And so we want to do everything we can to increase tourism and activity there. And we're finding a lot of uh, some of these places are just completely gorgeous and pristine and um, are just perfect places for people to come from metropolitan areas for, particularly for water resources, you know, we, the Clinch River, the Mayo River, um, amazing opportunities, you know, to do sort of like what they've done with some of these bike trails in Virginia to make the same sort of water trails in Virginia. So we have a lot of hunters and, and people who come to fish in the state as well, I take it. Absolutely. We have saltwater recreational fishing and um, freshwater recreational fishing. So both of those agencies that handle that, the Virginia Marine Resources Commission handles saltwater for the most part, and the Department of Game and Inland Fisheries, which is also in our secretariat, handles freshwater. Um, but no, 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 those are huge, huge economic drivers, as is the seafood industry. And speaking of the seafood industry, there is a uh, sort of unique circumstance in the state of Virginia, and that relates to Menhaden fish, I believe, yes. that one of your agencies has jurisdiction over that economic uh, uh, driver as well. Right. The Virginia Marine Resources Commission actually um, is involved in the Menhaden industry, but the fishery itself is managed by the General Assembly in terms of limits, right. et cetera, which is the only fishery in Virginia like that. But um, it's, it's, you know, it's, there's a lot of emotion and uh, uh, political issues associated with the Menhaden fishery that, that leads it to be managed by the General Assembly. So that's part of the economy of the Eastern Shore, as I understand it. What are those fish used for? Um, yeah, the, the biggest fishery is in Reedville, Virginia, which is on the northern neck. And um, there's two components to the Menhaden fishery. There's the bait fishery, where people catch Menhaden for bait. And then there's also the larger part of the fishery is related to actually rendering down for, um, for oil, for fish oil. 
So that's the major that's what the majority is used for. And I've been to Reedville and seen the plant and um, met with those folks, met with the fishermen, met with the opposition. That's part of part of my job is to meet with everybody and go see everybody. Uh, talk to us a little bit about climate change and resiliency. Climate change and resiliency, and you know, if you're from Hampton Roads, Virginia, which I am, you know that the sea levels are rising. And um, so we, rather than argue about the cause, we've been trying to affect on, uh, focus on what we can do to protect our coastal communities and, 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 and protect them for the future. The governor um, will tell you climate change is real. He campaigned on the fact that climate change is real and that he would reinstitute the Climate Change and Resiliency Commission that was laying, laid on the shelf during the McDonald administration. So we reconstituted that commission. Uh, we met several times over the first and second year of the uh, governor's administration and issued our climate change report this fall. And we're actually able to get some things in the budget in support of that um, report. Um, we were also very, very excited to have the governor announce together with um, Secretary of HUD with regards to the um, resilience competition. You know, we got a $120 million HUD grant more than any other state. Um, New York City and New Orleans beat us in terms of c cities versus the state, but it was the largest uh, resilience grant given to a state um, for, for Norfolk and, uh, and also a separate fund. Congratulations. I believe there were, there were about five recommendations that came out of that. And the first one was to establish a climate change and resilience resource center. Yes, we, um, there's money in the governor's budget to create a center that will um, be a cooperation of um, William & Mary's Coastal Policy Clinic, the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, and ODU. Um, and so we are working towards that. Um, there's also this fund, and I can't remember what it's called. Yes, the, is it the Virginia Bank for Energy and Resiliency? No, I don't think that's it. I'm, okay. I, with regards to the HUD, HUD oh, grant, okay. yeah. Okay. Yeah, that we're, we, that we're looking forward to and excited about. Um, we weren't able to adopt all five recommendations. Those were just the top five. Right. But we, but we did our best to, to, to pick ones that we could, we could work on. I guess probably one of the more controversial ones was the recommendation to adopt a zero emission vehicle program. Right. That, that was controversial, yes. Um, I think we're going to see more uh, fuel efficient cars, obviously, more, more electric cars. Um, and we'll see the industry, you know, adopting those policies as well. Well, how serious is the... Uh, 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 rise in, in, in sea levels. Uh, and we all know Hampton Roads uh, has a lot of bridges and tunnels. There were uh, uh, concerns expressed by the U.S. Navy several years ago about the problems there in terms of transportation. Talk to us about uh, those concerns. It, it, the, the concerns are enormous and they're real. And um, we've seen an 18 inch rise in the last hundred years. And we see the sea level rising, ex being exacerbated. It's, it's increasing in speed. And in addition to sea level rise, we also have the problems of subsidence, where the ground is sinking. Oh, okay. Now, there's a lot of theory that that's, in, that's related to the overuse of the Potomac Aquifer, which takes up you know, the vast majority of the eastern coast of Virginia and goes up further. Um, we are using the water out of that aquifer at a rate at which it is not being replenished. And that, that contributes to subsidence. And it also have, leads to concerns about salt water intrusion when the water table gets too low. We're currently working with some of the folks that use the most water out of the aquifer every day to try to reduce the amount they're taking. But a really novel concept that is in the works, there was an article in the pilot about this about two weeks ago, Hampton Road Sanitation District is looking at creating, reusing water and getting it back to drinking water quality standards and reinserting it into the aquifer which may do a lot of things. First of all, it will decrease nitrogen and phosphorus loads on the bay, but it also may reverse or even help with uh, creating a, mm -hmm. a lack of subsidence, reversing subsidence. Uh, do you see uh, a renewed emphasis on regional cooperation in dealing with, with some of these issues, uh, especially in light of the initiative called Go Virginia? Yes, the, I will say the Hampton Roads region um, you know, is incredibly integrated in terms of working together. You know, they have the they have several regional organizations. In fact, when I first became mayor of Hampton, I had a hard time keeping all the acronym straights for all the Hampton Roads, this and that organizations. But there's the Hampton Roads Planning District Commission. Of course, 
you know, everybody in Virginia is a member of a planning district commission, but theirs is particularly active and energized. Um, there's the Hampton Roads Transportation Planning Organization that looks at these issues as it relates to, um, you know, sea level rise and the effect it has on transportation. There's the Hampton Roads Military and Federal Facilities Alliance that deals with um, all of our military presence in Hampton Roads, which is huge. And so um, resiliency and climate change and sea level rise are a conversation at all those tables all the time. Yeah, I've heard that uh, uh, the sea level rise in Hampton Roads is, uh, is as serious as what could occur in New Orleans, Louisiana, for example. I think that's right. We just, we know so far we've been very lucky and haven't had a major storm. We also have issues with regards to public safety and, and uh, evacuation. You know, that's why this governor appointed Brian Moran, the Secretary of Public Safety, our Chief Resiliency Officer, because the well, um, if there is a huge storm, that's where the responsibility is going to lie. Is what are we going to do? How can we get everybody out of Hampton Roads out to a safe location that's high enough? We can barely get everybody out on Friday afternoon, right? Or a small percentage of the population out on Friday afternoon. So they're looking at different alternatives to evacuation, like sheltering in place, for instance, getting people out of harm's way until the storm's over. So public safety and national security, absolutely. given the fact that the Navy and the Air Force uh, is resident there. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and the Navy, I will say, and the Air Force, but particularly the Navy, are all in when it comes to climate change and um, discussing solutions and pragmatic solutions um, and are very involved in all these conversations. What, what are some of the other nat natural resources? Now, you mentioned coal, which is a declining industry uh, in terms of non-renewables, but we do have a lot of renewables we're working on now. Yeah, we just saw the first permit, um, special use permit issued, um, I think it's in Botetot for the first wind farm in Virginia. So we're excited about that. And that landowner, um, not only is he putting the wind farm on his farm, but he also has over 9,000 acres that, on which he's pledged to put a conservation easement after he gets this wind farm done, which is a great thing um, for Virginia. Um, now, what would that easement do? It would in perpetuity, make sure the property um, stays as it is now, essentially. It depends on what the terms of the easement are, right. but generally speaking, that's what would it be. And, it, and like I said, it is perpetuity. We saw um, our first uh, solar, big solar farm over on Accomac. Uh, the governor cut the ribbon on that not too long ago. Um, and so as we, and we, as we look forward to implementing the Clean Power Plan, which as you know, the Supreme Court just stayed implementation of the plan two weeks ago. But Virginia continues, is planning on continue to move forward with our with our stakeholder group. Our stakeholder group met last week. And um, the implementation of the Clean Power Plan or the Clean Power Plan as it, the rule currently exists will involve us looking at alternative sources as part of our package. Now, uh, Dominion is uh, the largest or one of the largest uh, energy producers in, in, in the state. And it has a couple of nuclear facilities uh, in the Commonwealth. Is there any talk about uh, new nuclear facilities being built any time in the near future? Uh, not to my knowledge. I mean, nothing that's not just not theoretical and speculation. I will say that um, our nuclear share really helped us when it came to um, the proposed clean power plan rule because, uh, the, because of the lack of emissions associated with nuclear power. So um, when, we, uh, when the first proposed rule came out, we didn't get any credit for that nuclear share. And so the governor really fought with um, on the national stage to make sure that Virginia got credit for our past good behavior. Now, transportation is, is something we talked about briefly, but obviously that's critical to uh, tourism. So I take it you work closely with uh, the Department of Transportation, Aubrey Lane, in, 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 that, in that effort. Absolutely. We have um, the best relationship with the Virginia Department of Transportation in the history of the Commonwealth. I'm, I'm comfortable in saying. Uh, Aubrey is an old friend of mine, and so that always helps to already have that relationship established when, when, you, when you come in. Of course, we're both from Hampton Roads. Um, but he has just been so great to um, all any natural resources issue or Department of Historic Resources issue or you name it, Game and Inland Fisheries, whatever it is, whether it's a bridge or a historic site or an aesthetic problem, whatever it is, he is door is always open and he's been amazing and helpful. One of the things they just did for us, a lot of our state park signs are weary looking, they're faded and bent mm -hmm. and all those kinds of things. And we just simply in the Department of Conservation and Recreation don't have the money to fix those signs. And so the VDOT is helping us um, get our signs back in shape and make sure our signs are correct. 
Um, it's, it's little things like that that are going to hugely impact traffic and tourism. I mean, I know that when I drive by a park and the sign doesn't look nice, I think that right. the park's not nice, and that's just not true. Or if the sign's wrong, um, or you know, the road's closed, or whatever, you get discouraged and you get back on the road. So we need to fix all those things so that we can continue to support and, and make sure our parks grow and prosper. Now, what about your work with uh, the uh, Secretary of Commerce and Trade? Uh, that, that's an important role in a relationship that you have as well. Absolutely. Of course, I knew Maurice also from his time at the pilot um, and when I was mayor. And so um, we were also in D.C. together for a short period of time. So we have a great relationship as well. And so, yes, a lot of the time, um, especially when it comes to energy issues um, and tourism, you know, because the uh, Department of Tourism is, is in his uh, uh, secretariat, yeah, our activities intersect a lot. Oysters is another thing, you know. True. Oysters, you know, the burgeoning oyster industry, nobody could have predicted that aquaculture would take off the way it has. So VMRC is in charge of management of that fishery and, and of course, and oyster leases which are, you know, obviously essential to oyster farming and aquaculture. Um, and then uh, Maurice is in charge of the tourism aspect. And then the Secretary of Agriculture, um, Todd Haymore, is in charge of marketing. So we all three work together to do the best we can. And, of course, that, that continues to highlight the continued necessity to maintain the health of the Chesapeake Bay as well. Absolutely, absolutely. And oysters have, like, so many benefits. I mean, not only are they, you know, delicious and wonderful, and not only is it wonderful that we have all these new aquaculture operations that are, you know, creating jobs and, uh, you know, helping with the new Virginia economy, and not only is it great that our public oyster grounds are, are doing better than they have in, in decades, not only is all that, all that great, but they clean the bay. You know, oysters uh, are great water filters, um, so it's just it, it's a complete win-win. And you know, the governor cut the trail, the ribbon on the oyster trail last year. You can go online mm -hmm. and check out the oyster trail. There's a whole I, I've been to several of these places that have popped up over the last few years, having oyster and wine pairings and those kinds of things. And you can get a seaside oyster and a bayside oyster and see see how they're different. And uh, it's really really exciting stuff. And it's a great time of year to eat oysters, by the way. Absolutely, got our month right. So when your term is up, uh, how, will you how will you decide whether you have been successful or not? Um, well, you know, my focus is on the governor's success. And um, so it, my, first, my first check of the box will be of the governor. <laughs> <Success>. <laughs> he's, been, he's been successful. Um, I think that it's very, very important, especially in a moderate state like Virginia, that, you know, we, we balance stewardship with economic development. And so I will have felt successful if um, we are able to pursue some of these initiatives that we've been talking about with the oyster industry, with our state parks, um, you know, getting some new state parks on the ground, maybe getting some of this infrastructure um, in place. Also, you know, I remember um, when I was mayor, when people would say, well, you know, how do you measure your success? Sometimes it's what you kept from happening True. as much as it's what you get done. So, um, you know, I'm just proud. I can't tell you what an honor and a privilege it is to serve in, in this capacity. Great. Well, thank you for being with us, Molly Ward, Secretary of Natural Resources. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching this special edition of Cable Reports, brought to you by the Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association. Until next time, I'm Woody Evans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.